<clears throat> okay, you heard uh, Christina mention a little bit about phase, so let's talk a little bit more about that at this point. We've got a couple different ways of trying to assess and calculate what monies a student might owe. One is tuition, another is a various different types of fees. Um, tuition, I think we're pretty pretty much um, understand what that is, but basically those are amounts that have been assessed based on a schedule, and it usually might be across the whole spectrum uh, of a table. It can be prorated by credits or by resident status in the U.S. Uh, U of T, you might call that legal status on your end. It could be a lot simpler than that. It could just be simply part-time or full-time. But I think we all have some examples in our minds about what that might look like. Uh, for six credits, you might be paying a flat amount, um, 21 45 But in the, any credits in the range of 10 to 18 would cost the same amount, 35 25 in this particular example. But fees are other um, assessments against you that are not tuition. And oftentimes they're associated either with a course or a program or something more general. And as you might imagine, um, a course, such a course fee might be a lab fee um, or a program fee associated with the executive MBA um, program. We know that Sigma Systems is going to be contributing uh, student account calculation and assessment functionality here for us. Uh, we still have a certain amount of uncertainty about the specifics there although they are currently working with both Maryland and Southern California to uh, kind of come up with what those details are going to be. So at this point, we're going to turn it back to Christina, and she'll remind you where those, uh, where those uh, fees can be uh, viewed there on the registration site. So an example that I've got here is that for this motion to choose group analysis, there is a fee associated with this, this an extra $25. So right now in the person's card, they're, they're kind of seeing the standard for this school $1,000 tuition fee for up to a certain number of units. So the, the courses that they're actually registered for, estimated tuition fees are 9000 And based on what's in their cart right now, it's still 9000 But as soon as the student adds this this other course that has a fee associated with it to their cart, it's going to say, based on what you put in your cart right now, you're going to actually owe $9,025. Based on what what's actually in their schedule, that one class they're actually already registered for, it's still just the $9,000, but with this um, additional class, there's an additional fee. This, uh, this link here that says, see my bill, that is, is meant to illustrate just for this purpose is that the, the calculation or the dollar amount that they're seeing right there is based on just their schedule. And there may be additional dollar amounts that, that they're responsible for that don't have anything to do with registration. And so that, that might be a separate, um, a separate calculation, something external that the CMI bill would take them to a place where they could see other charges or other things that are available, and maybe a different system entirely. Um, another place to look at this would be, you could see the fees in that if your standard fee is $9,000, but the student has put in seven different courses into their card, and that takes them beyond what the standard amount of courses that they can register for, their, their projected tuition fees would go way up. So they've got a lot more um, courses in their, in their schedule than the standard amount would account for. And so it's going to show them, hey, you're, this is, if, you, if you were to submit this, which there's too many courses in your cart to do, but even if you removed one, you might, you might be paying a lot more than you intended to. So it would, it would throw up a red flag there and say, pay attention to this. Don't, um, don't be surprised by your bill later. So those are the two places that really illustrate how we want the student to be able to see, see as they're working what their, what their choices mean for their estimated tuition fee. So I'm going to give it back to you, Hugh. And I think it's back to services. Um, 
In, in terms of what I want to do here is just talk briefly. There's a, there's a lot of words on this slide. I apologize for that. But I think there are a couple of concepts here. Um, and this is really about getting students into courses in terms of the mechanics underneath, the basic mechanics for actually completing a course registration. When a student is putting things into their cart, at that point, it's, it's really a request. It's a request for a registration. Um, we haven't actually made the connection yet. So um, underneath the covers, in terms of the way the cart is going to work, it's going to be an overall request for that cart that's then comprised of these individual request items. So each request item might be for a, um, a specific um, ad, a class, drop a class, swap a class, or it may just be to update the class. Um, one of the th one of the, or that registration. One of the things um, that that happens down at the course registration um, level is, in some cases, the student can opt for how many credits if it's a variable credit course. They may also have the opportunity to opt for the grading scale that's used. So there's, there are those kinds of things that may be comprised in that, in that basket on an individual line item basis. Um, that cart then gets uh, pulled together and, and processed for registration. So similar to the overall request, which is that cart made up of individual items, there'll be a response back. There'll be a response back on each item, and then there'll be a response for the overall piece. Um, so far, we've talked about um, a couple of different ways that the actual processing of the cart may happen. From a service perspective, we're going to need to be able to support, get into as many as I can, or it's an all or nothing kind of scenario in the course registration. By breaking up the underpinnings of the registration in the way outlined here, we're able to support either one of those. <clears throat> um, so once that response come back and, and comes back and everything's good, we actually have now what we're calling a course registration. So that's really the relationship between the student and the course offering. We're calling that a course registration at the business layer underneath the covers at our class one level. I'll just tell you what it is because it's kind of funny to me because we have so many acronyms. acronyms. It's an LPR or a LUI, Learning Unit Instance, Person Relation. These LPRs are really important down at that bottom base level because in this case they're representing the student's relationship with the course offering. That same mechanism at the class one level though would also represent a student or an advisor or a TA or anyone else that may be related to some learning unit instance. Um, the wait list then is also going to be a queue that we manage um, from a service perspective. Again, we've heard um, in this design process uh, with the, even the fairly small group of institutions we have today, folks do things a lot differently. So actually that wait list could be for the entire course or it could be specific to an offering or a section. Um, either one, doesn't matter, service is going to support both. Um, and then this is where, I, I, I don't know, I, I think, I guess services made up the name, but we, we kept getting confused between a wait list and a hold list, so, and hold having other meanings um, in the enrollment system. So we started calling it the hold until list. So I apologize for any confusion. It's the same list that, that uh, Hugh was talking about before. And, and really the idea of, and why we got to the hold until, it was, it's not that the student status is changing, it's that the restrictions on getting into the course change at some point, typically right before the, the class starts. We can go ahead, uh, oh, I'll pause. Any questions, thoughts, confusion, concerns? Get to the next slide. Okay, so then the other big thing that we were, we were faced with from a design problem perspective was really how do we evaluate registration eligibility? And I'm going to try to, I, I probably should have done a build on this, so I, I apologize again for the, this, but, but let's, let's kind of walk through it and I, and I think it'll make sense. What we're trying to do is make sure that we can accommodate and surface up to a business user level the ability to really configure what do we mean when we say go evaluate basic eligibility. You know, what do we mean in terms of holds and acknowledgments? And, and what are all the things that really come together in terms of the ability to evaluate a registration, in this case, course registration? I will, um, so, so let, let's just kind of go through it. 
So the, the first thing you'll see, that the, the um, basic eligibility is really a little mini process. And it's basically saying, go check basic eligibility. So some of the checks you might have in there are things like, is alive. Another one might be, has been admitted or confirmed intent. This just gets at the basic level. There, there may be five other things or ten other things in there. Again, this is where by, by defining this and exposing this, as a, as a process, an evaluation process configuration mechanism, we can provide sort of ultimate flexibility and configurability by institution. So a couple of things about this. You'll notice that it's an ordered list, so there is a sequence to this. For each one of those items, one is alive, two has been admitted, each one of those line items can refer to what we're calling a population. Over on the left, you see some blue ovals. Populations are really dynamic people sets. It's really defining some query that would define some group of students. So you might have one that just says everyone, because really the is alive and have been admitted, that's going to apply to everybody. Later down the list, for instance, if you go down to some acknowledgments confirmed, for graduating seniors, we want to make sure they've applied to graduate. So if you look down two levels down under acknowledgments confirmed, Item three is really just going to apply to graduating seniors. So what this allows us to do is to have checks that then are specific to populations. Um, if we move over to the right, what's going to happen is I evaluate each one of those. Each one of those items from a configuration standpoint, you'll be able to say, is this an error as in, you know, can't move forward, or is it a warning? Um, if it's an error, furthermore, you might want to say, is this one that I just want to keep track of that error so that I can present a summary back to the student or whomever later, or is it something that if that one hits, I just want to get out of here, there's really no reason to, to continue on. For instance, is alive. If the student isn't, at that point, we may just want to bail on the whole thing. Whereas if it's something about, um, let's go down to the holds, if it's something like um, an unpaid library fine, we probably want to, even though we may not let the student register, we want to go ahead and continue through the full evaluation for eligibility process so that we can compile all those issues and present that back to the student. Um, a couple other little things where you'll notice when you get down to the eligibility for the term, um, a process can reference another process. So for instance, um, when I'm actually trying to register for that term, I want to actually run the eligibility check again. What this allows us to do is start having some building blocks for programmers to be able to get to the level of eligibility they want. For instance, in order to actually get to my cart page, I may just have to have basic eligibility. But in order to submit my cart, I need to be eligible all the way down the list. So I'm going to pause. I tried to include some very tangible things in here, so it, it sort of made sense. It's certainly not, you know, complete or necessarily correct, but exemplary of, of, of what the process service can do. What's um, exciting for service geeks like me <laughs> is that this kind of process now is something that we're, we started and, and, it, and it was born out of looking at course registration eligibility. But as you start looking at other processes within enrollment, this same structure and mechanism can also provide things for like eligibility on can I access my grades, can I get a transcript, because there again, depending on who you are, there are going to be certain checks that we want to apply, and then we may allow that with a warning or actually stop you and say, you must go do X, Y, Z, continue with this process. So we're really excited about this one. Uh, this is Walter from Berkeley. I just have a, um, I don't know, a question about, um, I guess, load on the system when you have so many services going at the same time for some, this other might be a longer term question, but. You know, as the number of services grow and as the number of transactions, you know, for the variety of students get out there, um, you know, are there any load issues that you're anticipating as a result of this architecture? I'm going um, I'm gonna say that um, we are already in discussions um, with the devs and setting up some proof of concepts and some load kind of tests. 
Um, there are a number of ways that you can implement this in the background. I was talking with Larry, the, you know, the lead architect for the project yesterday about this, in fact. And there are ways that we can go get holds, get exemptions, and get checks in advance of even running the process. So those are sitting in memory as a one-time get, and it's not like you're bouncing out and getting these each time. So I, I, you know, I don't have a definitive answer, but except for, yes, we're concerned about it. Yes, it's part of the design that's happening right now. And yes, we have um, various performance tests that are starting to be executed or built out right now. Okay, thank you.